Hello everyone, and welcome to tonight's SANS webcast. Oh, you silly framework, an intro into analyzing .NET malware. My name is Sam McGeechan of SANS, and I'll be moderating tonight's webcast with our featured speaker, Ryan Chapman. If during the webcast, you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window. Please note this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording will be available for viewing later today. This can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Ryan. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate the intro. I will never be able to say the title of my own webcast as cool as you just did. <laughs> that was fantastic. All right, looks like audio and video are good. If not, just stop me. I'm gonna get to it. So. Hey everyone, my name is Ryan Chapman. I am an instructor here at SANS for Forensics 610, which is reverse engineering malware. In fact, I have a course coming up next week as part of this event, SANS Sydney 2020. Really looking forward to it. If any of you out there are actually going to be in my class, uh, cool, hi. And if not, whatever, uh, come take it with me or us at some point. Um, or just you know, hang out and, and watch some of the content that we produce. So I'm also a lead organizer for CactusCon, which in the United States and the state of Arizona, that is our largest security slash hacker conference, hence my virtual background here. And I have a silly website, incidentresponse.training. That's enough about me. The focus is not me. The focus is .NET malware. So. Today, we have a little under an hour total to get through this, and I want to talk about .NET. I want to give you an overview of .NET, what it is, talk about what code compilation looks like in .NET, and then give you a listing of tools that I personally really like for analysis. Moving into some quick wins for static analysis, and when I say quick wins, I actually don't mean quick wins for like how to analyze the malware, but rather how to determine like, yep, this is a .NET sample. And thus you need to implement the tools that we're gonna be talking about. And then we're going to be going over some demos. So this will be a demo heavy, and hopefully everything works out just fine for us, webcast. We're gonna go over a simple .NET example program, and then we'll be talking about obfuscation in .NET because most of what you're gonna be farting around with when it comes to actually reviewing the malware itself, it's going to be obfuscated and heavily. So we're going to be looking into ways to deal with that. And that will lead into looking at a real world environment sample, one that I came across just a month or two ago, a newer version of Agent Tesla. So. That will lead to questions in a wrap up. I will most likely go the entire hour or come very, very close to it because I like to over engineer things. I'm very good at doing that. <laughs> so instead of producing an hour's worth of content, I produce two or three and then I just shove it into a little ball and we go for it. So without further ado, let's get to it. Um, we will have time after for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Like, don't be shy. .NET, what is it? Well, it is a Microsoft platform to enable multi-OS and device development. But what it really does is it eases the burden from the programmer or the developer, but also from the operating system. And for that matter, the user. So more on that exactly how coming up. It consists of a couple different major components, one of them being the .NET framework. That's a big part of what we're gonna be dealing with tonight, here, today. Well, it's, it's early in the morning for me, but for everyone else, it's still tonight for you, right? So yeah, the framework itself, by the way, you can get more information on it by, well, once you get the PDF for this presentation, clicking on any of the links that you see that are underlined, for example, just showing here the .NET framework, like, hey, you click the link, you get a bunch of information. As I'm doing a bunch of research and as I'm throwing things on slides, I like to provide you the resources that I used or that I recommend for that example. So almost everything you see underlined has a direct link. So when you do receive the PDF for this webcast, you'll be able to click all kinds of stuff. I have a ton of them in here. So hopefully that helps out. 
In addition to the .NET framework, there's also .NET Core, which is Microsoft's essentially evolution of .NET. And it is open source. It is multi-OS compatible, if you will. I have it running on my Mac OS host now, which is actually kind of cool, running PowerShell on a, a Macintosh computer, essentially, natively. Well, let's call it natively, sure. So speaking of natively, or not natively, actually, the Mono framework allows you to utilize .NET programs outside of a typical Windows operating system, such as on like mobile in uh, on mobile devices is the word I'm looking for. And for years now, I've been actually running a tool called Network Miner in Linux. For example, like Kali Linux. I love Network Miner. It's a really, really good network forensics tool, but it's only. Um, a .NET uh, EXE. In other words, there's no native ELF of it, but that doesn't matter because by just using Mono, you can actually run it fully under Linux. And that is quite pleasurable the first time you do it. And you're like, wait, I'm literally running a Windows.exe in like Kali Linux. Like, what is that about? It, it gets really Sorry fun. To there, Ryan. It seems that we're not seeing your slides at the moment. Wouldn't mind just... Uh... Popping those ones up in display, that'd be fantastic. There we go, perfect, thank you. Sorry about that, I had it shared and it must have died. Well, luckily all you missed was basic intro stuff, so here we go. All right, so this is what I was referencing when I was referring to all the various items that you can click on. So in addition to the framework, core and mono, Microsoft has a ton of resources that you can use to learn about various .NET stuff. So I highly recommend that you take a look and uh, at their like learning .NET resources. Very, very useful. All right, the .NET framework itself is compatible with multiple operating, uh, excuse me, with multiple programming languages like C Sharp, F Sharp. Has anyone out there heard of F Sharp? <laughs> More like, you're probably like, F Sharp, what? Visual Basic, the evolution of VB.net, if you will, and not so much anymore, nope, but previously J Sharp. So there was a, a Java based component, if you will, that was decommed a couple years back. So additionally, you can have what's known as unmanaged code within the portable executables or the example given .exe files that are compiled. So you can actually have like an unmanaged C++ runtime embedded and have them interoperating with one another. And that's where it can actually get really sophisticated. We're gonna be taking a look very quickly here at some of the building blocks, really, the components that make what's known as managed code. So managed code is run by what's known as the common language runtime or the CLR. And this is essentially the runtime that takes control from the operating system and at a software level runs what's known as the managed code or the .NET compiled code. Managed code allows the CLR to implement garbage collection, type checking, exception handling, all the annoying things that developers of yesteryear had to personally account for any issues you may run into with like the Windows Memory Manager, any of that type of stuff, it's all taken care of by the CLR. So that folk, that runs the show, if you will, a stage master. And everything is compiled down into what's known as common intermediate language, sometimes simply referred to as Microsoft intermediate language or other times just called intermediate language, IL. It conforms, by the way, to the common language infrastructure or CLI specifications. But as you're going to see very shortly when we get into our demos, as I start clicking on things, I'll say like, hey, that's the CLR, that's CLI, and then, okay, wow, that's enough acronyms, move on. <laughs> .NET also comes with it a whole bunch of fun libraries. So you've got like the framework class library, the FCL that's organized into namespaces like system dot. Remember that system dot, you'll see more of that coming up. And then the FCL implements the base class library or the BCL. And what that is, is all the standard Windows API you know, native commands that you're familiar with and that you've come to love are implemented in .NET namespaces. And they typically live in one of these three DLLs or, or DLLs very similar to them, I should say, MS Core Lib, System and System.Core. 
All right, enough of that. Let's get to the fun stuff. When you generally compile a program, like say you just take C code, right? Like main.c. You throw it into a compiler. It pipes it over to the preprocessor, which makes decisions about, hey, how am I going to compile this? When I hand it off to the assembler, what am I going to need to do to optimize? Things like that. The compiler then runs through the assembler functionality, handing the code off to the actual assembler. The code then becomes what is known as object code. Object code then gets pushed over to what's called a linker. The linker looks at the libraries, typically, that are externally linked, and then makes decisions at linking time as to whether or not to statically or dynamically link those. So when you have malware or just any you know, Windows executable, for example, or Linux uses shared objects.so's, same kind of thing. Whenever you see a windows.exe reaching out to a windows api.dll file and invoking a function from within there, that's referred to as dynamic linking. So that is essentially done at the linker point where it says, you know what, we're just going to call out to that DLL, we're good to go. So that will result in a .exe file or a .dll with a, a function or 20 exported. And typically, that just gives you a portable executable. In .NET land, that is different, much different. The folks at Geeks for Geeks, and by the way, here's their website where I grab this graphic, infographic, if you will. Um, great article, pretty good site too. .NET uses what's known as just-in-time compilation. What that means is the C Sharp or the Visual Basic, for example, that gets written goes through a specific compiler that will produce a .exe or a DLL file. So a PE, a portable executable is the term for those, right? It creates that, but inside of it, in that PE structure, it includes a stub or a section of the header where it has the CIL, the common intermediate language, in addition to a whole bunch of very useful metadata. At runtime, in other words, when that .exe is executed, double clicked, you know, what have you, the CLR takes over. And that runtime environment then converts the CIL into machine code. So unlike with a standard C program compilation, where the result that you have down here is native code, the native code doesn't exist except for in memory at execution time. The CLR invokes the virtual execution system, which actually handles the execution, and all the managed code is then executed on the CPU. So that's a big old long mouthful, but there are some important takeaways for how we analyze PEs within a Windows environment and how we look at our malware. There's a fantastic article here called the .NET file format. It's old. It's not... It's not new, it was last updated, like, I mean, how long are the 14 plus years almost? So, are coming up on 14 years. So, Daniel Pistelli, I guess, is how to pronounce that, put this together and he shows that in the PE file format, there's something referred to as the .NET directory that you'll run into. It is often referred to as just the core 20 header. And inside of there, we have a neatly defined structure starting with CB. Remember, Charlie Bravo, CB is the first element or item inside of that structure, right? CB, and then some runtime versions and a bunch of other information. If you want to read all that stuff, it's all here for your perusal. But for us, when we look at the PE files, right, you're going to have your PE. You're going, hey, hey, back it up. What are you doing? You're going to have your PE files. You're going to have your cough headers like normal, but then you're going to have a CLR header and you're also going to have CLR data. And inside that CLR data, which the runtime environment can utilize, is all your metadata and then the actual IL itself, which will be further compiled into machine code you know, at runtime, right? So all of this is basically a really fancy way of saying that the CLR is really who runs the show when it comes to .NET. The really important takeaway from this is that the IL that sits inside that portable executable that is linked using a, you know, whatever .NET linker, Visual Studio, what have you, that is ridiculously easy. It's almost trivial to decompile. That is different from your typical .exe or portable executable that is not trivial to decompile, but rather is more trivial to disassemble. 
So if we have a normal PE, normally we go into a disassembler. Sure, you can have a decompiler, like an old school, like a snow, or if you pay for hex rays, or if you're using Ghidra, like we teach in Forensic 610, well then just use that, duh. But it's not as pretty or even close to as pretty as what you get with .NET. So in .NET, we have a number of different tools we can use. I've highlighted three of them, right? That's my guy right there. That's my other guy right there. And that's my little buddy right there. So general PE tools, I've listed the ones that we have installed on what we call the RIM workstation. And the RIM workstation is what comes bundled with um, Forensic 610. So in Forensic 610 through SANS, you get two different VMs. RIM Workstation is not available outside of the class because of licensing issues with, with Windows, basically. So if you don't currently have a Windows malware analysis environment, I highly recommend that you just grab a legitimate copy of Windows, or you go grab one of the uh, versions that Microsoft provides for edge testing. And uh, by the way, Lenny Zeltzer, the uh, co-author of 610, has a great article that I didn't link in here, oddly enough. Um, I'll add it in. But if you can look it up and it's uh, creating a virtual machine for malware analysis, something like that, I'm butchering the, the title probably. But that'll show you how to basically get like a base system set up, okay? Now, ILSpy was one of the original open source .NET decompilers. A fork of that, DNSpy, also includes debugging capabilities. And that has just like taken the, the infosec scene, right, by storm. Because at this point, I just go, boop. Dance by. Yeah, I'm going to show you a couple different ways to analyze things, but quite honestly, when I'm doing it, I just go boop and I just drop it right in there. I use it all the time. D for dot is a fantastic deobfuscation utility that we'll be using in our demo. And there's a bunch of other tools. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The three that we have in bold, however, are my absolute favorites. Initial static analysis, which we will get to in the very next slide section as we go into our first demo, can help you identify if a PE is a .NET sample. So right off the bat, one of the biggest things you'll notice is that there will be a single import of mscore.e.dll. Uh, that is the DLL, the import inside of which will be one of these two. It will be either underscore core exe main or underscore core DLL main. Here's an example in a tool called CFF Explorer of just that with one of the samples we're going to be looking at. So if your import address table just has mscoree.dll, pretty big heads up, like that, you're probably dealing with .NET. There are also directories, string methods, and you can pull the manifest, which comes with your compiled assemblies, all kinds of fun stuff, and we're going to get into it right now. So the first sample that we're going to look at is actually not malware. But rather, this is a challenge. And this comes from FireEye's Flareon challenge from 2019, from last year. So um, number seven, the official number seven Flareon, just ended, what, a week or two ago? Number six was a year prior. Challenge number one was a sample called Meme Cat Battle Station. I, I love the artwork. It's pretty sick. Look at this. I love it. A little like 80s kind of thing. Oh, I love it. It's good stuff. Written by Nick Harbour, so a little love to Nick, a little click, click to Nick. Hi, Nick, there he is. There's his Twitter page for you. If you want to check it out on VirusTotal, here it is. All right, it's not malware, by the way, but just because it's good to share and, and get information from VirusTotal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just pop right in to my Windows RIM Workstation VM. And we're going to take a look at this sample. This is Meme Cat Battle Station. If I double click on it, Oh, look at that. Oh, I love it. And it is essentially a, a battling, I don't want to call it a game, simulation? I don't know what it is, really. But what it wants you to do is you're the cat on the right, and you need to blow up the cat on the left. You need to get him. Pow! To do it, you need to put in the weapon arming code and hit fire. If I put the wrong code in like that, then I get the error message that says invalid weapon code. And I'll zoom in on it right there. It's just saying like, nope, that ain't it. So it's a challenge. We need to find out what's going on here. Okay, now what is this? Well, it's .NET. Okay, if I drag and drop it onto exe info, one of the tools that we bundle with, you know, our uh, Windows 
malware analysis environment. We see it says, yep, it's .NET. And it even says, you may want to try .NET Reflector. I don't want to try .NET Reflector. I don't personally like it all that much, although it is a very strong tool. And it is actually the first tool that I ever used for .NET stuff back in 2014-ish, I think, is when I started messing with .NET malware. So if I take this little guy right here and I literally just drop it onto bin text, which happens to be a string analysis utility that we like to use in 610, we will see a whole bunch of strings that give us some heads up that this may be .NET. First off, this pound strings, pound GUID, pound blob is a very big hint. More on that coming up as to exactly why you'll see very shortly here. If I scroll past that, you will see numerous references to the word assembly. And that's because the managed code that gets compiled down is considered an assembly and lives in the CLR header. So there's all kinds of just general strings that give you a heads up, this is .NET. For example, if you remember me saying to, re to remember, you remember the system.namespace, here are some examples, system.diagnostics, system.resources, these, these namespaces right here give me a heads up, like, ah, this, this might be .NET. There are many others in here. For example, there's an entire manifest that you can actually take a look at. I think it's over in the Unicode section. Yeah, here's a manifest that shows up. You can actually see it. It's just embedded within the PE header. It even references ASM. And you'll also see right here, name equals my application.app, that is the default name if it's not adjusted or changed for a .NET application before it's compiled. So if that name is not changed, you will see that. And you will see it with a lot of different malware that they don't change that name. They leave that name alone. If I right click on this little guy and I go to a tool called CFF Explorer, I will see right away that there is, on the left-hand side, a .NET directory. See that little guy right there? And if I click on it, if you remember, I asked you to remember the CB, Charlie Bravo. This is the first item in that core 20 structure. And you see here, it's located at offset 208. Here's the other information from there. And then here, remember those strings that I mentioned were a pretty good pretty big like tip that this may be .NET, strings, GUID, and blob. Well, here they are. These are actually part of the metadata streams. And that's the, remember the CLR header stuff includes the metadata, which is part of the .NET directory or core 20 structure. And of course, the actual code itself sitting in that PE. If I drop this little bugger onto HXD, a hex editor, and I go to 208, offset, this is where the header actually starts. Now, just in a hex editor, just looking at this, and I'm like, eh, okay. So that's why I like to use a tool that will parse that for you and tell you like, oh, hey, this is, this is, by the way, the .NET Core 20 structure, and here are the items within it. So what I want to do now is I want to, I want to drag and drop this guy onto DSpy. There are multiple versions of DNSpy, 32-bit, 64-bit, there's the .NET core version of it. There's also the general .NET, I guess we'll call it non-core or vanilla, like .NET 4.5 specific version of it. When you load DNSpy on the left-hand side, you will see the various assemblies on the system. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit for you, make this window a little bit bigger, and there we go. When I click on Meme Cat Battle Station, you will see something very important right away, and that is the entry point. So when this managed code runs, the entry point is the first piece of the code that will actually be invoked. So that is going to be in memecat battle station, program main. Now, if I just drop this little guy down right here, these are my assemblies in here. I drop that one down because that's the name. Here's program and here's main. Uh, also, I could just click, boop, right there and dnspy takes you right to it, okay? Let's back up for a moment though. We can take a look at some information about the PE itself right here in DNSpy. For example, if I click where it says core 20 header, I can see, hey, look, there's my Charlie Bravo right there, offset 208, and I can see all the other fun information here pertinent to the .NET specific header. 
I can also see these storage streams, which are outside of our scope for this particular talk, but my goodness, are they super, super useful. The one I will click on is field. The various fields that are implemented within here, like flag label, flag, what's that? Or hey, look, weapon code, oh, wait a minute. We can see exactly where they reside within that structure, and that is super useful. So, excuse me, I'm gonna go ahead and collapse the PE guy right now. And what I wanna focus on is the fact that uh, what we wanna do is find a code to hit fire, right? I don't wanna spend too much more time going over non-actual malware, but I do wanna give you a feel for how to use the tool before we go into the deep end. So if you look at the top of the screen here, you'll see the default is C-sharp code for decompilation, but we can also use Visual Basic, which the fidelity of which is not as high in, in this version of DNSpy I found over the past couple of months at the very least, so I don't recommend it. And also, if you really want to go in the deep end, you can actually just look at the IL itself. So if I scroll down a little bit and then I stop right about here, you can kind of get an idea if you're familiar with like assembly, x86 or AMD64 or what have you. will be like, oh, it looks like, like literally like that. And like, yeah, very, very similar. So I recommend leaving it on C sharp. I also want to point out that there are some known malware samples that if it's on IL, or excuse me, if it's not on IL, that the IL code included may be purposely tricking the decompiler to obfuscate or hide certain things. I have not personally run into one, but I do have a resource in the PDF that will kind of explain when that could happen and give a hash or two. So what we see in here is when the first main function runs, what does it do? Well, I'm gonna shortcut this part. I wanna to get to the, the real malware coming up, okay? But I'll give you the quick breakdown. We have a class instantiation here of what's known as the stage one form. After that, it gets run, application.run stage one form. After the form one runs, if the weapon code from there is null, we return. If you return from main, you're done, right? You're, it's over. So something in this stage one has to assign a weapon code. Okay, so if I just go over to stage one form, I see the first thing that it does is it runs an initialized, whoa, that's a weird word, initialized component, better yet, right? So whenever the class is instantiated, it runs initialized component. I say, okay. Now, by the way, some folks may realize right at this point, if you've been doing malware analysis, even for years, you may be like, uh, yeah, I'm not a developer, so I don't know what this dot initialized component, you're saying things like class invocation. I find that .NET analysis, because you're dealing so more with actual source code, that it's almost a heavier reliance on having a little bit more of a programming background. Now, some folks may be like, ah, that's dumb, but I'm, that's just the way I feel. Um, in a debugger, a lot of times, you know, we're just focusing more on, on the assembly and registers that are being used. So when this class is instantiated and initialized, the form or the window is drawn and one of the items that gets added here happens to be the fire button. And fire button happens to have a handler for when it's clicked. And that handler is this function here, fire button click. If I go here, you'll see that when this button right here is clicked, it looks to see if the text in there happens to be rainbow and capital letters. It's a direct string comparison. If it is, victory. If not, not victory, which gives me a pretty big heads up that if I just type in rainbow in all capital letters, ba bow oh, got him. And now we're on to stage two. So. The point of that is obviously it's not malware. The point is just to show you how easily it is to float through something and go like, oh, okay, well this you know uses that text box. Oh, no, there's a button I click. What's that button called? It's called fire button. Okay, it has a click handler. Oh, you know that's how you just trace through .NET code. There is a lot, a whole lot of literal code analysis. So the second level you can kind of guess, also uses a form, but this time stage two. Inside of here, hey, look, there's also a fire button click. This button click is quite different, however, because what it does is it passes whatever's in the text box 
to a function called is valid weapon code. You'll notice if I hover over it and take my, my hand off the mouse, it will say that the type of function is a bool, meaning a true or false, meaning that what this is going to return is a true or false. If it is true, victory. If it's not, meaning the actual comparison to what's in that text box is most likely in that function itself. If I click it, I can see exactly what happens. The text box code comes in as S, a new character array gets created. Each of the values in the string that you have in that text box gets XORed by capital A in ASCII, which happens to be hexadecimal 41 or decimal 65. Then there is a comparison against what you entered after it's been entered by hex 41 to these values here. They have to match. In other words, if you were to XOR these values by hexadecimal 41, it should give you what you should need to enter into that box. Now, this is just hexadecimal three, easy. This, however, may be a bit more confusing, and part of it is the way that the data is being represented to you by DN Spy. It goes, oh, well, that's a space, right? A space, an ASCII space is actually hexadecimal 20. Below that, we have an ampersand that also has a hexadecimal equivalent. So what I did is I just put together a very quick script. And what this script does, a Python 3 specific, by the way, script, is we do XORing by the ordinal value of ASCII A. I could have just done hex 41, honestly. We add these all up, and I can even put in, like, take the ordinal value of the ASCII letter, because that's what it looks like a DN spy. And then at the end of that, print out, like, just tell me what I'm supposed to be putting in that box. And if I do that, if I spell it correctly, you'll see that it's looking for bagel cannon. And if I go ahead and I put that in, bagel cannon, bow, we win. Yay, that's it. So that's the round one for flare on six, right? It was not malware. But I wanted to use that as an example, first off, because I just really like that. I think it did a great job on it. But I want to use it as an example of how when dealing with .NET, a lot of times you're going to be dealing with decompiled code. Now, in a perfect world, all of our malware that we deal with would look just like this. Oh, look it. It's all pretty. See, it just says initialize component. And this says, is valid weapon code? And you're like, man, this is the easiest malware I've ever dealt with ever, right? No. So in reality, you're going to be dealing with obfuscation in .NET and a lot of it, a whole lot of it. So on the right-hand side, here's an example of our next sample coming up, which is a real-world remote access Trojan that is based in .NET. Okay, it's called Agent Tesla. This is a more recent sample of it. Ran across myself around two months ago or so. This is the obfuscated version. We have what look to be Unicode characters, um, some script that I'm not personally familiar with. Uh, some articles call it kanji. I, any person who is familiar with this is probably like, that's not, I don't know what it is. But what I do know is it's also mixed in with what looks to be ASCII. So we have like, for example, right here, lowercase a, capital D, capital M, like what are those doing there? So this is actually all obfuscation. These are class names and namespace names. And these are variable names, list names, string names. Like keeping in you know, like that in your mind or in your notes, uh, lowercase gz and then that thing and then kkvg, like good luck, right? So there are a whole lot of frameworks that will produce code like this from your .NET assemblies. And that is what the malware authors are using. So here's a big old fat list of them, uh, paid, free, and open source. One of the ones that you're going to see a whole lot, for example, is uh, da, 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 reactor is what I want, uh, net reactor. If I click on it, it's commercial software. I can use a free trial. I can buy it, yada, 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 right? So let me shut down some of these tabs here. There we go. I gave you some examples here, like there's .NET Reactor. When you have code that is obfuscated, something to focus on is the use of binary arrays. 
So a binary array is an array within a programming language whose contents are binary values, binary raw data. So whether you're like debugging or decompiling or, or whatever you're doing, like action script for Flash malware, whether it's um, even just Python-based malware, like whatever it is, if that language has byte arrays, always focus on them. Whatever is put into a byte array is often going to come back out of that byte array, either obfuscated or deobfuscated, or at least on the path to one of the two. So I often will go through sometimes, well, I'm often, sometimes I'll just, you know what? I'm not even gonna try to deobfuscate this. I'm just gonna go find the byte arrays that are the closest to the entry point and see what the heck they do. What were they all about? Okay. So let's take a look. This is a tool called D for dot. It is currently unsupported and has been for a, a bit now, almost a year, I think, but it is still phenomenal. And yes, I like the word phenomenal. I think I've said it like five times already, whatever. So here, what we see is that um, using D for dot, running it on the obfuscated sample of agent Tesla, we have gone from whatever these things are to just methods, S method zero through S method five or list zero through list nine. Those are far easier to keep track of, to keep in your head, so on and so forth, right? I really like that approach far more than the alternative. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at this agent Tesla sample. Um, heads up, this is real malware and this is recent malware. So do not play around with this unless you are confident in your malware analysis environment capabilities. All right, if you're like, oh, I think this can get out to the internet, like don't, <laughs> don't, don't do it. So here's the sample on VirusTotal. It's available on VirusTotal. A couple different organizations, have, a number have been hit with this exact sample, right? So there's that. And what I'm gonna do is I am just going to grab this little sucker. First thing I'm gonna do is close this assembly in DN Spy. So you go away. Bye bye. And then I'm going to just basically grab it and drop it into DN Spy. And as soon as I do that, as soon as I do that, very quickly, it'll become apparent like, oh goodness, this is obfuscated. So the entry point is literally that, whatever this is, right? Here's your class, here's your, like, what, and there's your method, what, what is this? Right, if I click on this right here, click, it shows me, first off, I have all these, okay, cool story, I have all these assemblies down here, like those names are awesome. On top of that, this odd function name or method name, whichever you prefer, right? If you look at that, right below it, it actually invokes from some other namespace. Is that itself? Maybe it's itself actually, no, some other one. And then look at the name of this method. It's actually, it looks like Unicode data. It's represented to me right now as Unicode data, literally slash U and then four hexadecimal characters, right? So that's, that's confusing. And if I click on that, you'll see that all that really is, is enable visual styles. That's all that does. It's just a way to obfuscate the fact that that's all that it does. If I scroll down beyond that, we have a, an outer for loop, and then we have an inner for loop, inside of which we have the creation of a num, and then a num2 whose value is calculated based on num and whatever random stuff they came up with. And then this is basically a ping pong type of code structure, right? Branching, logical branching within the code. So at some point, it'll go back up to here. At some point, it will go to block one, which is here. You have another crazy weird function, and then you have another one that actually calls a sub function inside of it. If I click this thing, it even takes a moment to decompile. DN Spy is like, uh, hold on, <laughs> give me a moment. And then it says, oh, that, that just runs this. You're like, okay, what is that? I click on this, and we then get component resource manager. Right away, I would start to get really excited. I'd be like, oh, resources? Oh, yeah, okay. So in .NET assemblies, resources that are stored in these files can be extremely useful and very, very handy. In the previous sample, in the meme cat one, the resources are actually just all the graphics. 
And it reminds me of when you're uh, like using ResEdit, the resource editor on the old school Mac classic, like before OS X in 2000, 2001. And the Macintosh files actually were comprised of a resource fork and a data fork. Very, very similar to how they use resources. Resources are listed right here, right? Here are the resources. And they're right under, by the way, references. References is kind of like the import address table, but specifically for different .NET families. The type reference, which I don't want to drop down right now, but if I click on it, it will show me all the different types that actually get referenced throughout all this entire assembly. But the resources, if I drop these things down, I can see here just has some some raw data. Okay, uh, what's this guy called? Menu strip uh, tray location. Eh, okay, I see what looks to be potentially a bitmap with uh, system dot drawing dot bitmap being invoked for it. So while it may look like noise, it actually um, uses that data to properly draw a bitmap. But then I also see this thing called dolphin, and when I look at dolphin. Some of you right away are probably sitting there going, oh, wait a minute, I recognize that. Like, to a degree, I recognize that. What you most likely recognize, including if I scroll down, probably even more so if I scroll down, is it looks like Base64. So we have Base64 looking characters. We have our forward slashes right here. We have our plus signs over here. What doesn't match Base64 are these commas, right? There's no comma allowed in Radix or Base64. So that's kind of an oddity. Um, it also, by the way, starts with an equal sign as opposed to ending potentially with padding or an equal sign. So that's, that's a bit off. I can save this resource by just right clicking and choosing Save Dolphin. I can save it to my desktop and then I can pop it open in Notepad++ and take a look at it. And in here I can scroll like to the bottom and I go, yeah, it looks, looks quite a bit like base 64, but there's some type of decoding, obviously that's happening somewhere, right? So how could I find that? Well, let's take a look. First off, what we wanna do is we don't want to mess around with this ugly code. So I'm actually going to close it. I'm gonna remove this assembly and then I'm going to run D for dot. So I have, it myself on this system and I have put it in my environment path so I can just run uh, D for dot and you'll see it has all kinds of really cool things you can uh, force it to do. It can decode strings in many different ways, all kinds of fun stuff. I am just going to run it and pass it the sample and hit enter. The first thing it does is it tells me, hey, I've detected an unknown obfuscator. In other words, eh, I'm not 100% sure what we're dealing with here, right? It has, at the time I last looked, 19 well-known obfuscators that it can very easily reverse, if you will. This one's not one of them. But it says, you know what, whatever, I'm gonna clean it and I'm gonna rename the obfuscated symbols anyway. So I'm gonna ignore the one error, which it actually says right here. So we have the quote unquote clean version. So let's take the clean version and drop this onto, get out of here, drop this little sucker onto DN Spy, and let's open it up and take a look. Dun, da, da, da. The first thing I noticed right away is that my entry point now makes far more sense. So I have NS12 for namespace 12, class zero dot main. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. If I click on that, if you recall in the obfuscated version, the first thing I had was some weird obfuscated call that eventually just ran enable visual styles. Well, the D for dot was just like, you know what? It does this, moving on. You're like, oh, okay, cool, thank you. And then after that, we still have the bouncing around between code kind of stuff. But what I wanna do is I want to identify where the dolphin resource is utilized all the different places. In order to do that, I just go up to edit and then I go down to search assemblies. Now when I'm in search assemblies, which I'll drag this window up right here, I want to make sure I'm searching for all different types. So I leave it on all of the above, but I only want selected files. I don't want all files because I don't want to search through every assembly. That would be a nightmare for me. Uh, potentially, I don't know about the word dolphin, but for other things, that's horrible. 
So I leave it on selected and I just type in dolphin. I hit enter and it finds three locations where dolphin comes up. One of them is actually the resources, okay? The resource itself. The other two are both in namespace 28 class five. So I have dolphin and then I have git dolphin, which by the way, happen to be right near each other. So it's basically this guy and then the invocation here. So git dolphin, what does that do? Well, it does, again, it sets up that kind of ping ponging between uh, cases, a switch statement, right, in the code. But we can see that it was going to fill something called result, which by the way, gets returned, return result. So whatever it fills to result is probably what I want. And that is going to be a call to class five S method three, that guy, and it's going to pass the string dolphin. So if I click on S method three, I see it's actually just get string. So I go, oh, it's going to invoke get string, but use the resource manager and tell it to get the resource called dolphin. In other words, it's going to create a string with this, this content right here. And I'm like, oh, okay. So whoever calls dolphin here in class five of namespace 28 wants that string. So who wants that string? How do I find that? Well, if you're like, you know, an Ida, you would do like, just hit the letter X for cross references, right? Well, in here, we're going to right click, go down to analyze, and then zoom in a little bit for you. And you'll see that dolphin, the get function is used by, oh look, one place. It's used in one place. Cool, what's that? It's namespace 23 class three method zero. All right. I double click on that and now we start to have some real fun. So I, get, I see that another, and look, if I scroll, it's another similar type of thing, right? Outer loop, inner loop, there's num, num two, there's probably a num three in there at some point, but result will be filled and returned. And what result is, is it's a call to that dolphin uh, being passed into S method three along with two other parameters or arguments, which is comma and then AAA. If I look at method three, you'll see that it's actually just string replace. And if I hover over it and I take my mouth, my mouth, that'd be weird. If I take my hand off my mouse, better yet, I'll see that just as you might expect, arguments it expects are old value, new value. So if I go back, we are going to take the string that we get from that class, the whole base 64 looking thing. We're gonna replace every comma with three A's. So I can do that manually. I can just go right here, I do a replace, uh, find comma, replace with triple A, replace all, and I will save this to my desktop as dolphin two. I'm just calling it number two, why not, right? Now this looks a lot more like base 64. I will tell you that if you try to decode this as is, yes, it will fail miserably, okay? But, so good. So now what I wanna do, well, first off, I wanna check my time. Oh, good, we have 10 minutes, we're perfect. All right, sweet. So now it's going to take that value that you get out of this and pass it to class three S method zero. Okay, what's that? So I click on, S method zero. And in here, this is the function that's going to receive that potentially base 64 encoded data, right? With the replacement of comma to triple A. So what's this going to do with it? Well, it's going to create an array. Let me move this window down. It's going to create an array. It's going to do once again, there's your num. Here's your num2 with calculations. So it's gonna do some ping ponging between case statements in this switch, right? All right, whatever. But as it's going through here, what's it gonna do? All right, we have num3. Here, I see array. So I'm gonna set a breakpoint. I scroll down, I see result. Oh, look, result. Result's gonna be the array. It's gonna take that array and to S method two. What's S method two? get a string. So it's gonna get a string out of that array. In other words, it looks like the array that it's creating here, based off of what we see right here, this is going to be put into an array, it will be manipulated, and then what comes out of that will be a string and that will be passed back. So maybe this is the deobfuscation function. 
It is, by the way. It totally is. So here's how it works. We're going to set breakpoints wherever we see the array being touched in these switch statements. So I set one here. I'm going to set one, well, on the result, sure. Here's another place where array gets touched. And here's uh, another one right there where array and on the return too. And then I'm literally just going to hit start. I'm like, you know what? Run the malware. Let's do it. So we're running the malware. And again, this is where you have to make darn sure that you have a solid, stable, and um, well, <laughs> well segmented out malware analysis environment, or you're going to run into a bit of a rut row, right? So here, uh, the first thing we stop on is we're going to make a variable called C, which is a single character. And it's going to be the value at your array. And the array, by the way, here's the original string called string zero. And then here's your array. And if I drop it down, you see that there it is. First character is equals and then some A's after, right? So this is just an array of this data at this point. So I say, okay. The first thing it's gonna do is num starts off as zero. And then here's num, zero. So it's gonna take the very first thing in this string, which happens to be an equal sign, by the way, and it's gonna set it to C. So if I let it go past that, I hit F10, and I take a look at C, I see it is an equal sign. And I go, oh, okay. So it is storing the first character in that string. All right, I'm gonna hit continue, go to my next breakpoint. Now we're gonna set array num, and by the way, num is still zero. So we just say the first character, which was an equal sign to C, and now we are about to overwrite it. What are we going to overwrite it with? This is the deobfuscation technique itself. We're going to go into the exact same array. We're going to take the length of the array, subtract num. The entire length minus num, num right now is zero, is still the entire length. But then we're gonna subtract one. What does that mean? That means that we are going to set the very first character to the very last character. If anyone can guess, we're about to use the C variable next and you you probably know what's gonna happen. We are then going to take and take that C, which was the first character, and we're gonna put it at the end. Num will then be incremented. And if you haven't yet, what it's doing is it's transposing one character a piece, and it's moving towards the center. It's a center in, I guess, algorithm, center out. Uh, it is going to reverse the string. So this is a string reversal mechanism. That's all it is. So if I take these off, let's take my breakpoint off, except for the final result. And I take you off, take you off. I think that was about it. And I hit continue. We'll get to the very end. And then here's our array. And you'll see that in the array, now we have the data has been reversed. All right. I can actually step out of this hit F10, it should very shortly return. There's the return, the result from the calling function. If I drop that down, I see this information, go, okay. If I step out of that guy, I see that we're gonna make a new G class. And then, oh, look, a byte array. Remember when I said to focus on byte arrays? Here is a byte array called byte underscore. Nice. <laughs> and it's going to set its contents and the contents that it is going to get. If I take a look at it after it sets those contents, oh, hey, look at that, 4D5A90. It looks like a PE to me. It looks potentially a stage two. I can keep letting it run just a couple more F10s. We're gonna make a brand new assembly with the data from byte underscore. And then we're about to invoke that assembly, specifically greek.sparta. So it's making a new assembly, greek.sparta. I'm gonna stop this and I'm gonna minimize that. I'm gonna take this text. This is base 64, I wanna reverse it. So I am going to make a file called base 64 in Remnux. I'm going to paste the information in. We can cat it out to see that there's 
we're in Linux, so we can just go reverse, done. And then if I want, I can take a look at it. So, okay, uh, starts with TVQQ, okay, cool. And I can go to the end of it, and I see now it ends in an equal sign. That seems a little more like base 64, right? The whole time, perhaps it was just flipped. So now I can actually decode it. And then I like to redirect to, or better yet, pipe to XXD to do a hex dump and then take a look at the results. And you'll see, hey, look, it looks like it's a portable executable. So we have our 45A over here. We have our PE here. And if I were to scroll down, we see that we have some various section names that if you've done general malware analysis before, you'll recognize these. If not, well, we, you know, we cover them in 610, right? And we keep going down. In fact, if I just do one of these, whoop, oh, I just went right past it. Here we go. You will see a bunch of strings that to me tell me that, oh, hey, this in itself is a .NET assembly. So I can actually redirect this to stage2.bin and we can run a tool called PE frame. Type that to less, that'll take a moment and give it 10, 15 seconds. That's going to give me information about what I just dumped out. So what I just dumped out is available for me, uh, da, 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 or available to me better yet. Over here, I put it under .NET webcast. I'm gonna take round two. Ah, here we go. Here's our PE info. Let me actually, uh, let's see, uh, replace it. And then what did I just call it? Round two, copy. I'm like blind copying between my VMs here. Is this going to work? Oh, look at you, round two. All right, I have it on uh, my Windows machine here because we've got like a minute or two left. We see here that it is a valid PE. We see it looks like potentially a .NET DLL. Now, we also see that the file description is Sparta. And if I take this and I drop it onto DNSpy, so we've got our round2.bin, for example. I drop it here. You'll see that it's actually named Sparta. However, you'll also see that it is furthermore obfuscated. However, the obfuscation in this does a little bit better in our little friend D for dot. So if I open these up, you're like, well, okay, I have Leity, decompress. There's the XOR decrypt kind of thing, but and I'll just close it for now. If I go ahead and run D for dot, and I just drop this round two on it, here's the magic part, I love this. Round one was obfuscated with an unknown obfuscation utility, but this one is very well known. It goes, oh, that's .NET Reactor. I got you, don't even worry about it. So now we take round two clean, drop that onto D and spy, and it's all cleaned up and ready for our further analysis. If I drop it down, drop down the DLL, now take a look at the names I have in here. Remember that we were trying to force the assembly into memory and then load Greek Sparta in here? Here it is. And then the actual first thing that runs is called start game. There's even an XOR decrypt in here. And the best part about the XOR decrypt to me, you know, is that if I scroll to the bottom of it, take a look at what it does. It returns a, uh, a byte array. I didn't mean to click it. You silly guy, go back. It returns a byte array. So if I have no idea how this is working, and if I don't know which keys are going to be pushed into it, because that's one of the arguments, it doesn't matter. I can just set a breakpoint on that silly thing and then just see all the stuff that gets decrypted. <laughs> Isn't that fun? All right, so I came right up against our time. So let me get right back to our PowerPoint. Da -da -da. And it says we're done. <laughs> so I hope everyone that uh, quick foray into .NET analysis. With .NET, there's a lot more code analysis. So if you don't necessarily have a programming or development background, it is something that you will pick up on the way because whenever you run into something in .NET, an invocation, a class, or something, and you're like, I don't know what this is, you Google it, and that's how you learn it. So thank you, everyone, for hanging out with me. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks again to Sans for the opportunity, once again, to run my mouth on uh, one of your streams, and especially for one of the events. 
And for anyone who will be in my 610 class next week, I'll see you soon. We are going Thank to do- so much, That was a fantastic presentation. We haven't got any questions at the moment, but I'll allow people a minute or so to, to put anything into the window. Um, in the interim, if you would like to see a schedule of all the upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. You can find your CPEs for all completed webcasts by logging into your SANS portal account, to navigate to your account dashboard, then click my webcasts. You can then download your CPEs on the right hand side of the web page. And I believe we don't have any questions coming in for you again. So you get off the hook and you get to uh, okay. hold on a night. Thanks so much, Ryan. Really appreciate the presentation and looking forward to working with you again next week. Yeah, thank you again for having me. And everyone have a good uh, day, evening, night, all the above, whatever it is for you. <laughs> all right, see ya. Good night.